Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We're in Matthew chapter 24, and today we're going to be with, we're going to be dealing with what I think is the single most important day aside from the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That would be first in my mind. But this day is without a doubt the second most important day that mankind throughout his history has ever seen. There's not been a day before that's like it, and there won't be a day when this happens after this happens that will be like it. This is the, this is the big matzo ball. All right. This is it right here. And because this day that we've been, we talked a little bit about it last week, talking about the stars falling from heaven, and we talked about things that were shaken, some things that were fallen, although I haven't done a complete um, exposition on that yet, as far as showing you all the places in the Bible where somebody fell. But you have a, a lot of them. I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. Dagon fell twice. Babylon fell twice. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the Bible says. It says it twice, so that's what I believe. And you have Saul falling on his own sword. You have Judas, who after he hung himself, and I can tell you how this happens. You may not like the gory details, but as the body corrupts at death, then what happens is, you know, rigor mortis sets in at first and stiffens the body, but that doesn't last forever. It's only a couple hours. And then the body starts loosening up. And after a while, I've helped to pick up a dead body. My brother-in-law does this for a living. That had been dead four days. And my brother-in-law was gracious to me and just said, stay here in the kitchen he lived in a trailer home. He said, stay here in the kitchen. I'll, I'll put him in the, in the Ziploc bag. And he, I heard him say, boy, I'm glad his clothes are still on. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to ask, but I said, why? He said, because he's already starting to come apart. And that's what happened with Judas Iscariot. Once he hung himself, after several days, the Bible says that he fell headlong in other words, his body separated from his skull and it fell headlong and his bowels gushed out. Oh, that's awful. But that's what the Bible says happened to Judas who betrayed Christ. All right. So we've talked about things that have fallen in the Bible. But let's, let's uh, sort of refresh our memories on the fourth kingdom. If you remember... Uh, Daniel was taken into captivity. Um, he was given the name of Belteshazzar. Uh, his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, in which, by the way, Daniel, um, Hannah, Mishael, Daniel and Mishael both have El in their name as Elohim, the name for God. Uh, Hannah, and Azariah have a form of Yah, which is Jehovah in their name. So they were named after God. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar didn't like that. So he gave them Babylonian God names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So anyway, in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And when he wakes up, it troubles him. He cannot remember the dream, but he knows it's significant. And so he calls upon his astrologers, his soothsayers, his magicians, and his Chaldeans. And the Chaldeans were a race of people that were, I mean, they were very well educated in the occult. So he calls upon them to give the interpretation. They have no idea. They said, tell us the dream, we'll give the interpretation. They were going to make it up. They were going to lie about it. And Nebuchadnezzar called him on it. And he said, if you don't tell me what I dreamed, then I'll know that you've prepared lying and corrupt words from before me, and I'm going to cut all your heads off. How's that? Well, Daniel, so you have four on one side, the 
uh, let me get it right here, the magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, and Chaldeans on one side, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, their Hebrew names, on the other side, four against four, right? The four gospels from the kingdom of God versus the false gospel, another gospel, another gospel, any other gospel, any other gospel, Paul said four times, you have them clashing, and guess who wins? The true gospel of Jesus Christ, because Daniel, God revealed to him not only what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed, but gave him the interpretation of it. So in Daniel chapter 2, I, boy, I love this. God, God God's always going to win. Every fight, every battle, he's always going to get victory. Amen to that. So in Daniel chapter 2, um, he starts explaining, he gives the dream to Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold, the chest of silver, the legs of brass, the feet of iron, and the toes, part of iron, part of miry clay. And then he says in verse uh, 40, interesting, and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. Remember that, because we're going to see that today. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. And what did Jesus say about a kingdom divided against itself? It cannot stand. I love it. Jesus was referencing that fourth kingdom when he said that. Um, and he said, And as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. But whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. So it's the joining of opposites here. Iron and clay. Iron cannot be moved, cannot be shaped. Clay, you can make snakes out of it. That's the easiest thing that we did with Play-Doh, right? Make snakes, or you can make, you know, little plates, or you can use the fuzzy pumper barbershop that they sold for a while. I don't know if they still sell it. But anyway, you can make anything you want out of, out of clay, out of Play-Doh. Um, so it's partly strong, partly broken. These are opposites. In verse 43, whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. And that's what we're looking for. Not a pill, not genetically modified food, not a vaccine, we're looking for they who are going to mingle themselves somehow, some way with the seed of men. The Bible's, to me, the Bible's very clear on this. And they are, since we're dealing with the number four, Ephesians 6, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual, meaning spirits, spiritual wickedness in high places. So I believe that the stars falling to the earth initiate that mingling together. Let's look at Matthew chapter 24, starting with verse 29, and then we'll just go from there. And I've got a lot to show you in the next, I don't know how many Watchmen broadcasts this will take. But I can say that literally, a lot, most films are written with this in mind. Graphic novels, movies based upon graphic novels, TV shows, commercials, advertising. You know, when they say things like better together, and that's a very popular phrase now, it's being marketed everywhere. What does that mean? It means that mankind will eventually be better if we join with those who come down and want to mingle themselves with the seed of men. That's what it means. Matthew chapter 24, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days 
Shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. The powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So we see here, and this is what we're going to focus on this week. The stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. So, and what we're going to do to begin with is we're going to identify biblically exactly what stars are. Now, if you ask Neil deGrasse Tyson, if you ask um, Bill Nye, the science guy, they all think they know what the stars are. However, they've never actually traveled to one to know that that's exactly what they thought it was. Because I believe, and I, I mentioned this last week, I, I used to hear all the third of the stars are going to fall from heaven. And I'm going, well, that has to be a meteor shower because there's no way that the you know stars, which are billions and billions of light years away, that they're going to fall on the earth. They would just consume the earth and burn it all up. Especially, literally, there's a star called Betelgeuse, and it's massive. Our own sun would consume this planet if it fell to the earth, okay? But what are those stars really? We'll find out. The parallel to this in Revelation chapter 6, when Jesus opens the sixth seal. Remember what the number six represents. It represents the sons of God mingling with the daughters of men, producing the hybrid race of the giants. Okay? So in Revelation chapter 6, 6, the sixth seal is open. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? And I believe that at this time, the Antichrist has not yet been revealed. They still don't know who he is. I believe, and I'll make this clearer in upcoming Watchmen broadcasts, but I'll just kind of throw this out to you. I believe the Antichrist appears as a direct result of the fourth kingdom, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness, mingle themselves with the seed of men. Sort of like Adam and Eve mingling together, cohabitating together, and what happened? The two became one flesh, literally in the form of Cain, who was of that wicked one. And you know, I just thought of this. There, here again, there's a pattern in the Bible of events that are going to take place. Second Thessalonians 2 says that that day our gathering together unto Christ shall not take place until the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, and the falling away takes place. Jesus said that when he sends his uh, workers out in the field where the tares are, to gather first the tares and bind them in the bundles to be cast into the fire. There should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then he gathers us together. And, and naturally, when you look in Revelation 6, you're dealing with the seal judgments which precede the trumpet judgments 
which we're waiting to hear the last trump. So again, I believe there's an order to everything that God does in the Bible, and I believe, and I trust in that order. And I believe that God is going to follow that order, and I do not really see contradictory scriptures. All right? Now let's move, let's put that aside for now. We have a lot to talk about today. So let's deal with this issue of what are these stars? If God shakes the heavens and the heaven is vast and huge and, you know, planet Earth seen from Mars looks like a star in the sky, like Mars looks like a star to us. Okay, so it seems to be insignificant. How is it then that God is going to shake the heavens and a third of the stars of heaven are going to fall to the earth when they burn up the earth instantaneously or even before they got here, they would they would burn up the earth. But that's not all that stars are. I do believe you go out in the night sky and you look up and you see those white dots there, they're stars. When you look at them through a telescope, you can see a little bit more of their of what they look like, how they appear, so on and so forth. They're now able to detect by the slightest wobble of the light from a star. They're able to detect that that star has planets rotating around it because as the planet moves between its light and our perspective of that light, the planet sort of blocks the star just, just for a second and scientists are able to depict up that blockage, that wobble, and say, that's how we know there's a planet there, all right? So, but there's more to the stars than just them being lights up in the sky. The Bible makes it clear to us, I believe, that what we're seeing concerning the stars is but a glimpse of or just a tiny fragment of what they really are. Stars are angels. Numbers 24, verse 17, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Seth. This is obviously a prophecy of Jesus because it capitalizes a star out of Jacob. So the Bible's telling us that a star represents the angel of the Lord, which was Jesus Christ. We're not done yet. Judges 5, and they fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean that there was a meteor shower on Sisera's armies and that's what killed them? No. I believe uh, Deborah here is the judge over Israel. She's prayed unto God and God has sent angelic help from heaven to allow Deborah and the armies of Israel to prevail in this world, in this war and destroy Sisera's army. And so clearly, the stars in their courses fought against Sisera. The stars in their courses, we would call those constellations. Now, how many of them are there? Oh, sorry, I left my other two fingers at home. There's 12 of them, just like the 12 tribes, just like the 12 apostles. And we then will ascend into heaven and we will be as the stars of heaven, the Bible says. I love this. Job 38, 7. When the morning stars sang together and the, all the sons of God shouted for joy. So right here, the Bible is explaining to you that stars sing. Why? Because they're living beings. And that's, that's not hard for me to fathom at all. They are living beings and they sing together because they are the sons of God. 
They are angels. Daniel 12, 3. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And he's talking about the saints. Those who help bring someone into the body of Christ, the kingdom of God. We're wise. The Bible says we're going to shine as the brightness of the firmament. And if we turn people to righteousness, that God will allow us to be as the stars forever and ever. And we're going to basically take on the nature of angels. Revela or Amos 5.26, listen to this. These are, this is the bad guys. But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Chion, your images, the star of your God, which you made to yourselves. So it says it right here that stars represent the gods that the Israelites worship. God, in fact, God told the Israelites in no uncertain terms that when they get into the land of Canaan and they find out that they've got a different religion than what God taught the Israelites 40 years in the wilderness, he said to them, I don't want to catch you learning their religion. I don't want you doing it because if you do, I'm going to come on, I'm going to come down on you meaner than a rattlesnake. Well, that's, I'm sort of paraphrasing there, but you get the idea of it. Uh, I believe it's in, uh, Deuteronomy 4. Yeah. Deuteronomy 4.16, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is written, that is in the waters beneath the earth. And lest thou lift up thine eyes into heaven and that, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and what? The stars. Even all the host of heaven shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations unto the whole heaven. God, God said, I'm going to get in the killing mood if you do that. Did he? Yeah. He did. But he said, don't worship the stars. Why? Because they're gods. The whole teaching of astrology tells us that the stars are not just non-living balls of burning fire up in outer space, that they actually are spirit guides and their movements determine what's going to happen to you on any given particular day. Don't fall for that, people. Don't, don't fall for it. Uh, Revelation 9, and the, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So it specifically mentions here in Revelation 9 that the star was a him, and to him this star was given the key of the bottomless pit. I personally believe that that's Satan. I could be wrong. It doesn't say that. But the fact that how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. And when it says that I saw a star fall from heaven and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit, I think Satan can't wait to get that key from Jesus Christ, who's the only one who holds it, to unlock that prison where those devils are so they can come out and wreak havoc on planet Earth, just like in the days of Noah. Revelation 12 pretty much clenches it for me. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Verse 4, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. But guess what, Satan? You're going to get kicked out too. And so in verse 7, there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. 
neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. You see, earlier, he takes a third of the stars of heaven. Now, he's taking the angels and casting them out of heaven. I have a, I have a theory. Pastor Lord Sinrock, Pastor Sam from India, uh, these two men, I love them and we support them every month. Um, with the blessings that God sends us, we take that then and send that to other ministries, some of it. Because I know their work, I know their love for the King James, I know their love for the preaching the gospel. And India is a hard place to preach the gospel. I'm telling you, it's hard. But they have 330 million gods that they follow. Now, what is, think about that number, 33. 330 million. Where did that number come from? Is it written in any of their texts? No, I don't think so. They just came up with a number, 330 million angels or a million gods, what they follow. Um, Shakti, Shiva, Brahma, uh, Ganesh, the elephant-headed god, Hanuman, the Bigfoot, the Satyr. That's kind of what I think. But anyway, what is one third as a decimal? 33%. Point 33. So you see why? Do you understand what the 330 million gods are that they worship in India? They are the one third of the angelic realm that is going to rebel against God and be cast out of heaven unto this earth. And I'm telling you that once they get here, their goal then is to build an army and rise back up again so that they can have access to the throne of God. That's what they want. Satan wants power. He wants total supreme power. And he's not going to rest until he gets it. He's not going to get it, though. Amen? Amen. Now, there's actually a picture of this in your Bible of a third, which is, if you were to write a third out, you would write 0 0.3333333333. And it would never end. It would be an infinite string of threes after the first three. What does three represent? You know, I'm, I'm doing a new study on this number. Okay? It's something I haven't done in years. I'm taking what, I, what I've learned over the last 23, 24 years maybe. And I'm going back and doing more study and more research from the Bible on these numbers. And I guarantee you there's things that I didn't see back then or didn't know back then. That when I see them, I'm going to go, Woo! That is awesome! I'm looking forward to it. So I'm studying the number three again. In this case here, we have a story in the Bible a typological picture of a third of the angels 
falling out of heaven. You want to know where it is? First of all, let me read this verse to you, Job 26, 11. The pillars of heaven tremble. Remember, there's a shaking, right? And are astonished at his reproof. So what God's telling you is that there are pillars that are holding up the heaven. Okay, the, the, the outer space to keep outer space and earth separate. There are pillars holding that up. Now, I think those pillars are in the form of atmospheric pressure. Okay, that, and I don't, I'm not a meteorologist, so I can't explain it beyond that, but that's what I think. I think the four corners of the earth are north, south, east, and west. Even though you have a, the circle of the earth, you still have four corners, north, south, east, and west. So anyway, watch this. So you know that there's pillars that God says was holding up the heaven, right? Have those pillars ever been taken down? Judges chapter 16. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and there were upon the roof about three thousand men and women. See that number three? It represents the third of the angels in heaven. So think about the roof of the building is heaven. In a lot of temples, like in the Vatican, in St. Peter's Basilica, what's up on the ceiling is not just, you know, a white ceiling painted. It's got frescoes all in it, and they're all scenes of, of heaven. God up in the Capitol Dome of St. Peter's Basilica, and all the little naked baby angels that are around them. Boy, do those priests like those naked babies for some reason. Anyway, same thing with the Capitol building. The apotheosis of George Washington is in heaven in the Capitol Dome above everybody else. So the scene, in fact, the word ceiling, in Italian, the word for the heaven is, I think it's cielo or ciele or something like that. It's where we get the word ceiling from. So I'm making a point here. The ceiling, the roof, where the 3,000 people were, those 3,000 people represent the angels that are about to fall. Let's read the story. Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember, I pray thee and strengthen me, I pray thee only this once. O oh God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up of the one with his right hand and of the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein so the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Drop my hat. I love this. See, it's a picture of Christ because he's doing this, right? And he's destroying his enemies in his death. Whew. Samson then takes the pillars that are holding up the cielo, the heaven the ceiling, and all the 3,000, which represent the third of the angels up there. And when he pulls those pillars together, what happens? They all fall down. Isn't that awesome? 
That's a picture of what God is going to do in that day. That's when I believe the fourth kingdom is initiated. It begins on that day when the angels, a third of them, get cast out of heaven to this earth. And then, of course, the ones that are beneath the earth get let out, too. Okay? Now, I'm like a lot of normal people. I've watched a few movies in my lifetime. Some of them I enjoyed. Some of them I were going, oh, this is the worst movie in the world. Like Wonder Woman 84. Ter stupid movie. Um, Shazam. Somebody told me, oh, Pastor, you got to look at that, man. It's got stuff all in it. It took me weeks to watch that movie because I could only handle like 10, 15 minutes of it at a time. It was so childish. I hated it. But what I've done is collect from a lot of the movies that I've seen, and there's no way I can cover every movie that deals with God's falling stars, aliens, whatever, coming down to the earth and having some form of significant effect on mankind. Let's start with this. This is one of my favorite ones. The original Superman movie with Christopher Reeve. Now think about it. Look at the, look at the upper left hand of your screen. His father sent him from a planet Krypton. You know, Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster, the guys who invented Superman and the Superman comics, they were both Jewish. And they, and they incorporated some Jewish Kabbalah teachings in the life of Superman. The fact that he comes from the planet Krypton, the word Krypton is where we get the word crypt. Crypt is a grave where we seal up the dead. It is also where we get the word cryptography, which means the study of secret languages, secret codes. We, the CIA, the NSA, they have people who do, and they have computers who do nothing but crack cryptic messages shared by spies. That's all they do. Okay. So the word Krypton means secret, secret place. And the fact that Superman's father on Krypton was named Jor L, he was of the house of L. L is God. You get it? The son of God, look at the image here, fell down from the heavens like a falling star Landed in Kansas for who knows what reason. Landed in Kansas and becomes this at becomes the savior of mankind, and he could fly. You know who Beelzebub is? Beelzebub. Some scholars say he's the Lord of Flies. Like you know, I, I, this stupid flies flying around my face. I don't think he's just the Lord of flies. I think he's the Lord of everything that does fly. Get my point? Okay. And by the way, in, in the original Superman, the first three movies that were done, uh, the first two I think were done by Richard Donner. And the rest of them, they weren't any good. But anyway, they were filmed back to back and... Superman falls in love with Lois Lane, wants to marry her. They say, you've got to lose your powers as a Kryptonian. So basically, he falls from his position as Superman. He mates with Lois Lane. They have a love scene there. And then in the movie Superman Returns, we find out he's got a love child who's half human and half Alien, because that's what we're talking about. Then we have the remake. I think it's Zack Snyder, the Man of Steel. 
remake of the Superman movie, and it was done well, I thought, but it's the same idea. We have a god living on a, from the house of El, living on a planet Krypton, falling down to the earth, you see it there, and his father, Jor-El, is telling him, you can save them, son, you can save them all, you can save the whole world. You could be the bridge between their world and ours. Did you catch that? Cal L in this, and by the way, he's 33 years old in this movie when this happens. His father died when he was 46. Not Superman was 46. Uh, Clark Kent's father, Jonathan Kent, died at 46 years old. 46 for DNA, get it? So he here he is in his hour of temptation in front of a mural of Jesus Christ trying to decide whether or not he wants to save the world or not. And of course, you know, he does. And he dies and he's resurrected again in Batman versus Superman and the Justice League. Okay? You see what I'm saying? All of these, so far we've seen two movies, and they feature things falling out of the heavens, an alien of some kind, and he becomes this hero, this savior, just like Jesus Christ. All of these people, another Jesus is what they are. This is from Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind. All of these aliens, coming down to the earth, landing on the earth, and an exchange program. 12 people from the earth are supposed to go up into the mothership, and it, I said this earlier on a PMO, it dawned on me, and here's this scene here, you can see it up the, at the upper right. This is actually a military chaplain doing a prayer service for these 12 people who are gonna go with the aliens to the alien planet, and the aliens are gonna leave someone of their people here on this earth. But the guy is reading out of a prayer book and they're chanting back to him and he says, may the Lord give his angels charge over thee. Well, the angels he was referring to were these extraterrestrials in that mothership. They were angels that fell, came down from the sky. Actually, in the, in the movie, they came from the north, into the northwest. By the way, Roy Neary, the character of Roy Neary that the little aliens actually pick to go into the mothership first, they give his date, his date of birth. And when you calculate his date of birth from the time, and then the time that the movie was re released, guess how old he was? He was 33 years old in this movie. And there's other 33s in this movie. You have to watch it to see it. Here's a movie called Life. And art reflects reality, right? In the movie, they send a probe to Mars, scoop up a bunch of dust. The probe comes back from Mars, flying to the Earth. They capture it in the International Space Station. They have a chamber all set up to see if there's life in there somewhere. And they find an organism and they start growing the organism. The organism uses every part of his body is both brain, muscle, um, lungs, heart, eating. In other words, he's like a superior form of life than mankind. And he figures, the alien in this movie grows, figures out a way of killing everybody on the space station, and then falls down to the earth and is released into the earth. Okay? That's the movie Life. Here's another movie called Knowing with Nicolas Cage. Nicolas Cage uh, happens upon a series of numbers that was written by a little girl back in the 1950s. And he's wanting, to, and he figures out that these series of numbers were latitude and longitudes, dates and times, and 
and how many people were killed. 9-11 shows up there with the exact number of people that died on 9-11. And so he realizes that he has a manuscript that has prophecy written on it. And the last prophecy to be discovered, it looks like originally that it's the number 33. But then they turn it upside down and it's EE. -E. And somebody says that represents everybody else is going to die. And they find out that a big solar flare is going to come and hit and fry the earth. But lo and behold, angels descend down from the heaven and they rescue all these children. They rescue all these animals. And they take them up into the ships and they put them on this heavenly world now where everything is peace and harmony and they're running through the fact that they're running through wheat fields tells me that the imagery is supposed to be that of Elysium the fields of Elysium which is in like in Roman mythology was the place where people good people went when they died they went to the fields of Elysium where they enjoyed living forever and ever and ever. And that's in this movie, knowing you have angels here. In fact, you have four of them, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. Crazy, right? This movie, Arrival. It has, again, 12. Again, I left my other two fingers and, at home. 12 spaceships, like the 12 tribes, the 12 apostles, the 12 constellations, 12 spaceships come down in various places around the world. They're trying to teach mankind enough of their language to get them to understand that in the future, these aliens need mankind because there's an evil alien race that's going to try to kill him like 3,000 years in the future. And Amy Adams, who was in the Man of Steel movie, she's the heroine of the movie. She figures out when they, they, they write their language in circles, which look like um, a serpent biting his tail. Every one of them does. Okay? The circles always represent time in the Bible. In Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. From the place uh, that it started, that's the place that it goes back to, and I'm paraphrasing that, but you get the idea that time in the Bible is a circle, and they speak in a language form where linear time is left out of it, and they came here to give mankind a gift. Once Amy Adam, who is the scarlet woman, she's got red hair, and there's the scene where she's drinking wine, she's got a cup of wine, and she's like the, again, the heroine of the movie, the, hero, the female hero, and they give her the gift of knowing the language. Now that she knows the language, she actually can predict the future. Get that? All because the stars fell from heaven and they came down there and they said, we need your help. There's a, there, there are bad people out in space that we need to fight. Do you understand that when a devil tells you that there are bad angels that want to kill us all, they're setting up mankind to fight God himself. Okay, uh, here's, here's another Spielberg movie, E.T. E.T., the extraterrestrial, he falls down from the heavens. He gets left behind. He has these children. By the way, he dies and is resurrected again. Then he takes his finger. You see, you see, see that image of the E.T. finger touching Elliot's finger? Where have you seen that before? In the Sistine Chapel, the finger of God touching Adam to give him life. But that's not how it happened, is it? God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And of course, E.T. telling Elliot when he puts his finger to his forehead, where his 
his forehead where the mark goes, saying, I'll be right here. I'm telling you, movie scripts, TV shows, I, I could go for hours talking about the number of movies, TV shows, even commercials that you've seen that are showing you the most significant day that's ever going to happen on this earth is when those stars of heaven fall to the earth. Those stars, those angels, when they fall, they're not just going to go hide out from human beings. They're going to carry out a plan to mingle themselves with mankind. Wow. Uh, how about this one? The day the earth stood still. T the, both versions of it, the 1950s, and I like both of them. I like both versions. I have both versions. Legally, I don't download illegal movies. You shouldn't either. That's stealing. Um... I'm a science fiction guy. I like science fiction. But in this case, Kla'atu, the space alien who looks an awful lot like Keanu Reeves, just saying. And Michael Rennie was the original from the 1950s, ver 50s version. They came down here to tell us that mankind has nuclear weapons, we're dangerous with them, and they're here to destroy mankind because they don't want to have to deal with mankind as soon as mankind figures out how to venture off into space. How close are we to that? You got Jeff Bezos of, of Amazon, you have Elon Musk of PayPal running all these companies that are making um, spaceships. Let's just call them for what they are, spaceships. Coming up with ways to enable man to get off of this planet. Why? Because they believe that some catastrophic, catastrophic event is going to take place and they're not going to be here when that happens. And I've got scriptures that, and, and they're not going to be for today, so I'm going to wait on that. But I've got scriptural backup for all you flat earthers that says, yes, they're going to escape the earth, live in the heavens, but God's going to make them come back down. It, it, something occurred to me. I've seen several movies about, you know, people flying into space. Um, what's the one with um, Clint Eastwood? where these old astronauts, the old Mercury astronauts have to go up in a rocket and repair an old satellite. It's a Russian satellite. It's got nuclear bombs on it. And they have to repair that before it falls to the earth and blows something up. It starts a nuclear war. They can't have that. And you have um, one of the characters, one of the old characters in the movie, dying on the moon. Let me ask you a question. We've sent, I don't know how many with the Mercury program, the Gemini program, the Apollo program, and then the space shuttle program, and now the International Space Station program. How many humans have actually died in space? To my knowledge, zero. Zero. Uh, the uh, Challenger incident, they were not in orbit. The Columbia accident, they burn up on re-entry. They were actually in the Earth's atmosphere when they burnt up. The Apollo 1 astronauts all died in the capsule on the launch pad. And I have a theory about that too. I think they were a sacrifice. I think they, I think Apollo 1 sacrificed the first three astronauts 
to appease the gods to allow them success in the later missions. Because other than Apollo 13, every Apollo mission went off nearly flawlessly and doing things we had never done before. But anyway, no astronaut that I'm aware of has ever died in space. They've all died right here. And God said, though thou exalt thyself among the stars or, or um, build thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. It's just a thought I had. That's the day the earth stood still. Here's another one called Starman. If you see this movie, his spaceship comes down like a falling star. It's glowing and everything like that. It crashes. He comes out, finds the DNA of this guy that Jeff Bridges plays. He ends up with Karen Allen, who later on went to become the girlfriend of um, Indiana Jones, right? Well, they have a scene where they mate, they couple together. He's, remember, he's an alien that took on, he fell from heaven, took on the form of a human body, made it with this human woman, and he leaves in this wheel within a wheel ship. I'm not kidding you. It's a wheel within a wheel. But he tells the woman, you're going to have a baby. And he will be human and know what humans know, but he will also be me and he will have all of my knowledge. He will be a great teacher on this earth. He's talking about the Antichrist. And I think that the next Watchman broadcast, I'm going to show you how practically every secret society in the universe is hiding the fact that when these stars come down from heaven, they're going to mingle themselves with mankind, thus producing a very, very important person on this planet the antichrist that's what i think i'm going to do next anyway that's starman uh here's one called annihilation the opening scene a star is seen falling from the heavens burning through the atmosphere lands at a uh, lighthouse in florida and Something about this alien entity or this alien virus or whatever it is, it begins to spread and it has, it creates a border like a bubble around it that they call the shimmer. And the shimmer is growing slowly, but it's growing. They, and they've had to evacuate people out of the area. And they send four, four women in to try to investigate what happened to a previous group of men that went in to find out what happened. And they realize, you see this picture on the bottom, they realize that inside this bubble, everything gets refracted. Not just light. You know, light refracts. Like, light can either reflect, like from a mirror, or reflect, reflect through a prism, and you get the seven colors out of white light. Well, one of these scientists figures out that everything that's in this shimmer bubble is mingled with everything else in this shimmer bubble. So you have these trees that grow in the form of people because people and all creatures who have DNA, we have something in us that determines our size and our shape, how many fingers we're going to have, the arms that we have, the right and left side, the legs, the form of our body, head, torso, arms, legs, back, everything. And she says, those genes have been mingled into these bushes, and these bushes have taken on the form of human beings. I'm watching this for the first time, and I'm going, are you kidding me? 
Basically, this movie is about an alien thing that mingles itself with the seed of men. City of Angels. Seth, an angel, a watcher. If you watch, if you've ever seen this movie, look, watch these angels. They're watchers. They just stand and look. They watch people. And every now and then when somebody dies, they go and they take them and they lead their soul up to go see God and live in a happy place. Everybody dies and goes to a happy place, according to them. But Seth falls in love with Meg Ryan, who doesn't fall in love with Meg Ryan. Seth falls in love with Meg Ryan, meets up with a guy played by Dennis Franz. He's in there smoking cigarettes and drinking beer and he's eating bacon. He's in the hospital because he's got a heart problem, had a massive coronary and he's and he finds out that he, you know, Nicolas Cage finds out he used to be an angel. His name is John Messenger. And he's like, I fell in love. And boy, do I love this place. He's smoking cigarettes and drinking beer and he's eating bacon. He's, he's like a hedonist. He's enjoying everything that this world has to offer. And he tells Nicolas Cage, you know, I, I see you're looking at this woman. What are you in love? And he said, I think I am. And he said, you want to know how I did it? He said, you have to fall. And he literally got up on this high tower and fell to the earth. Whoops, that wasn't supposed to happen. He fell to the earth, busted my tablet, and now he can mate with Meg Ryan. How many movies now? Superman, Starman, City of Angels. They're mating with human women. Uh, by the way, City of Angels was based upon a German film called Wings of Desire. Now take a look at this. This is actually a, a movie that came out a few years ago for like for teen, the teen audience called The Space Between Us. And it's about a mission to Mars, we finally send, guess what, six people. Six people to Mars, one of them is a female. She doesn't know it, but she got pregnant on Earth. She goes to Mars, has the baby, dies in childbirth. The baby lives on Mars for 16 years. And I want you to understand this. Mars is not like over there from us. Mars is up there in the heavens. So we have a child born in heaven. And he wants to come down to be on earth because he's got a girl friend that he's been chatting with on earth and he wants to meet her. And here he is in this movie at the beginning watching the movie Wings of Desire which was the German film about an angel falling in love with a human woman, falling down to mate with her, which is what the City of Angels is built on. And then here's, here is the space between us because he does come to earth and guess what? There he is in the sleeping bag naked with his girlfriend or teenagers. This is evil people. He's the spaceman that came down from the heavens to mate with a human woman. But his body can't live down here, so he went back up into heaven, and we see his girlfriend training at NASA so she can go up there with him. You get it? Mm. Then we have, this is the last one. The movie Rampage. Take a look at this picture. You got astronauts on the International Space Station, again, working on genetic modification. Something goes wrong with the space station. These canisters are sent down to the Earth. They're falling like falling stars down to the Earth. And one of the doctors is telling the rock what's going on with this genetic thing. That basically it can alter the DNA of anything that it comes in contact with. 
And it's based upon an old video game of these, these big gorillas and these big other things, you know, they're tearing cities down. But basically, they took genetics that were made up in the heavens and they fell down to the earth and they just happened to mingle themselves with creatures that live on earth, mingle themselves with their DNA. Pretty interesting stuff, isn't it? So, already... Oh, oh, wait, 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 wait. I'm not done. Not done. I only thought I was done. The movie Elysium. Remember, I mentioned Elysium a while ago. It's part of Roman mythology. That if you're a good person, you don't go to Hades in the underworld. You go up to the fields of Elysium and enjoy the bliss and comfort. Walk through the wheat fields, the beautiful sky, the beautiful trees of Elysium. There's no wars up there. Everything's great. And you can enjoy immortality in Elysium. Well, they make this movie like a hundred years in the future where they built, they apparently they built the Jeff Bezos um, star city that spins around, gives them artificial gravity. They have an atmosphere on there. They're able to grow and, and have their own, to be self-sustaining city up there. And it's a city up in the heavens. Think of New Jerusalem. This is a replacement for New Jerusalem. And you've got an overcrowded, overpopulated earth, and they're all in poverty. And everybody wants a ticket to go to Elysium because in Elysium, they have these machines that if whatever sickness or whatever ailment, or if you age a little, you just get as a citizen of Elysium, you get in the machine, the machine analyzes you, fixes your skin, turns you back into a 25 year old bombshell good-looking woman or good-looking man. It heals your diseases and so on. But that technology up in heaven is not for the people down on earth. So Matt Demon, Damon, Demon, whichever, he's the hero. He's the one that carries the code in his brain that when the code is inserted into the computer system that runs Elysium, it changes the city of heaven. It's like rewriting the Bible. It changes the city of heaven and makes all the citizens of the people of earth citizens of Elysium. Just poof, just like that. And now all of a sudden the robots are dispatching all of these med bays down to earth to cure all of mankind's diseases. So that an already overpopulated earth now, that now that they have these machines, those people are never going to die. And that's what this movie's about. It's about the powers that are in heaven coming down to earth, giving immortality to mankind here on this earth. And oh, by the way, the ships that carry the med bays. Notice that I put little red circles around the emblems that are on them. One, two, three. The six pointed asterisk looking type emblems. Six, six, six. Now, I know that's movies. But think about it like this. Not everybody reads the Bible. In fact, most people don't. Most people that know better and should read the Bible don't read the Bible. So, the devil has to introduce this idea that when mankind sees these stars these angels falling to the earth. He's indoctrinated mankind with all of these movie themes to make man think that this is going to be our salvation. 
These gods are here to help us. These um, ascended masters, these angels are coming down here to make mankind better, to make mankind into gods. And again, that hasn't happened yet. So there is no mark of the beast anywhere in anything on the earth right now. It's not there. It is coming. But it's not here yet, people. Quit reading everything and believing everything you see on the internet. Because it has you, number one, in total confusion. It has you gripped in fear. And I believe the devil has a misinformation campaign that if you really knew the lies that were being told to you, it would blow you away. Hopefully, it, but with some people, they, it wouldn't matter. You could show them the truth and they won't believe it. I'm hoping you're better. I'm hoping that through anything that I say and the scriptures that I give you, the illustrations that I show you, the things that I catch while I'm watching a TV show or a commercial or I see an advertisement somewhere for something, the things that I'm trying to convince you of that come from the Word of God, that you'll believe what this Bible says and you'll not fret over what the evildoers of the earth are doing. You won't fret yourself. You're just going to believe and stick with the King James Bible. Maybe it wouldn't hurt for you to cut the cord on your internet for, I don't know, a month. See what happens. And if you do that, call us. We'll send you a packet of everything that we did for that month that you chose so you won't miss anything that we did. I just want to strongly encourage you to get you to understand that no matter what InfoWars says, no matter what Q says, no matter what Anthony Patch says, we're not in that days of that great tribulation yet. When's it going to happen? I don't know. But I promise you, we will all know because we'll see things happen and we will say, this is that which was spoken. And see, what a lot of these guys do is that they see something going on in the world and then they wrap scripture around that, mold scripture around that and say, see right here is proof that we're already in the tribulation but it's not true. God does everything decently and in order. And he's never going to do anything out of order. That's how we can know what God is going to do in the last days. Study your Bible. Read your Bible. Pray while you're reading your Bible. Meditate. Think on these things the Bible says. And then God will start delivering you from the lies that you're holding on to right now that are just not true. This is Pastor Mike. You're the reason why we do what we do. Thank you for your love for us, for your help in what we do. We have another feeding this week. We're going to help the Kenya pastors again. So pray for us as we do this, that God will bless us and that we have the ability to keep doing what we're doing. 
We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.